All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about how I built this uh, isolation table for my turntable, um, and that's what the form's going to be about. But you can actually apply these ideas to use this with any kind of uh, analog device, so maybe speakers or something else. Um, so that's just a picture of what it looked like when I had my turntable <coughs> in my apartment, and uh, kind of get an idea of how it would be used. Uh, the turntable just goes on top. Pretty simple. So. Why would you need an isolation table? Um, because basically you want to isolate certain things like turntables from certain frequencies, maybe like a subwoofer. In, actually in this picture, my subwoofer is directly below the turntable, which is a terrible setup, but it's the only thing I can do. Um, so that's why I needed this. And this is not like a sandbox device, which uh, if any of you know, that's like a, basically a box full of sand with a little plate on top, and then people think that that isolates whatever's sitting on top of the sand, but it actually only um, damps the amplitudes of the frequencies that go through the sand. And so it's not actually isolating anything, it's just damping. Uh, whereas this, uh, this table actually will isolate pretty much uh, anything that sits on top of it. And so the benefits of this are very real compared to a sandbox device, and there's no like, audio file voodoo that you might apply to this. This is all based on physics and math, and, and so so let's begin. Um, I got this idea because I was thinking cars driving down the road, you don't feel all the bumps in the road because the cars have coil springs, and these coil springs isolate the car or the passengers from, uh, from the vibrations in the road, and so we can apply this idea to audio and use the same coil springs, like here, uh, just an example, uh, we can apply that same idea to uh, isolate our analog device from the vibrations on the table surface. And a few things that you need to realize or think about uh, are that when you have a, a larger mass on top of your strings, that will um, produce a more effective vibration and isolation. If you think about a really heavy marble slab and you drop it on some strings, it's going to oscillate more slowly than um, I don't know, a lighter, maybe like a thin aluminum plate sort of intuitive. Uh, and uh, also with coil springs, they each have a spring constant k, and that's in newtons per meter. And uh, basically that constant is what defines the properties of the spring. And we can combine these constants, uh, which I'll go over later, to give us a total spring constant of k to q. And so the goal of this project would be to choosing a mass m, which would be the mass of whatever you have sitting on top of the table, and a uh, spring constant that you would look at online, there's, you know, there's websites, uh, you can choose springs with uh, various properties, you can choose a K, and with those together you can effectively isolate certain frequencies that you, you want to uh, isolate your table from. So in dynamics, we realize that the spring mass system is just a way of applying a second order harmonic uh, oscillator. and a second order, order harmonic oscillator is just, um, it's a differential equation, uh, which we don't need to go over tonight. That's <laughs> not what we want to do. Um, but basically, it's any system that can store and release energy on its own without applying external forces. And so what that would be is uh, if we were to take a really heavy rock and, and drop it on this, there's springs under here, by the way. Uh, if we take a really heavy rock and drop it on top of these springs, uh, that rock carries kinetic energy, and then these springs absorb that kinetic energy into potential energy, and then release it again into uh, kinetic energy. <coughs> and so the frequency that that oscillates at is the natural frequency. And we can describe that with this equation here. Uh, omega natural is the square root of keq, which is our spring constant divided by the mass. So if we think about in uh, real life terms, we're not going to have just one uh, frequency that this table is isolating at. It's going to be arbitrary vibrations. And uh, we can literally decompose these into a sum of infinitely many sinusoidal oscillations. And uh, using the Fourier transform uh, of this vibrational pattern, that'll tell us the amplitude and the phase <coughs> of each sinusoidal component of the vibrational pattern in the table. And if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. It's uh, we don't need to get into that in huge detail tonight. But the resulting amplitude spectrum 
a sub omega uh, tells us the amplitude for each sinusoidal frequency omega. And uh, in a uh, real life situation for most of these frequencies, like 300 hertz, 400 hertz, 500 hertz, maybe 6,000 hertz, these will be really small. But with base frequencies, they can get rather large. So that's probably what we're going to try and focus on for at least a turntable application. And because our system is linear, the net response is just going to be the sum of the responses of the individual sinusoidal inputs. And that's, that's a big help because there's no mixing of frequencies. Uh, everything that goes into the table, so uh, you have your different vibrations on the table at, at different frequencies, but every separate frequency on the input is just a ratio of the output to input. There's no, you don't mix different kinds of frequencies. You just have, there's a, the springs absorb some of the amplitude and you get an output over input response for each separate frequency. So what I just mentioned was that output to input amplitude ratio and that's AO over AI, output over input, which you can see omega. And that'll tell us uh, how our spring mass system is, how well it's working to isolate the uh, table that's sitting on top or whatever you would have sitting on top. And so the spring mass system, you can't really completely 100% isolate whatever sitting on top because A sub O, the output amplitude, will never be exactly zero. But we can get really close. I mean, 0.001%, which is basically nothing. So really how close we get to zero just designs on, uh, is based on our design parameters. So for any second order linear harmonic oscillator with an output to input ratio, in, uh, output to input amplitude ratio at any frequency is just this. That's all it is. Um, and yeah, that's all it is. Uh, but we get this by solving the differential equation, which I'm not going to go over because you either learned it or you don't care about it. So yeah. Um, but this, the solid red line that you see kind of spiking and then coming down, that is the output to input response. And that's what we really care about. But there are some other interesting things about this, such as this point here and here, and also this, uh, this relationship, this uh, approximate relationship. And so for that first dot, this at 1.4 here, this guy, we can note that the let me explain what the first dot. This is the by the way, this uh, uh, here is the normalized input frequency. So that's omega over the natural frequency. Um, so basically what you're getting on the bottom, uh, 0 0.1 through 10 is just the um, how many times your natural frequency, whatever frequency you're putting in. So uh, at 1.4 times the natural frequency, our output to ampl our output amplitude is the same as our input amplitude. And that's because when you have omega n over omega n, which is 1, that's where the system wants to oscillate, because it's the natural frequency. So at all frequencies around the natural frequency, you're actually going to get an increase in the output. And so we want to put the uh, natural frequency somewhere outside the range of the frequencies we're trying to isolate from, since you are going to get a small, or rather large, when you get very close to the natural frequency um, uh, output there. So also then, at frequencies of about 3.2 times the natural frequency, you get about 10% uh, of the input amplitude is the output amplitude. And that can be seen here, you get 10%. And we can also see that at um, 10 times the natural frequency, you're only getting 1% output amplitude um, when compared to the input amplitude. So from this, it's an important generalization to make is that at omega over omega natural equals 3.2, uh, that past that, it will kind of asymptote out to be just about this green dashed line. And that green dashed line is omega over omega n raised to the negative 2 power. So using this relationship, we can determine that the natural frequency can be no greater than 10, time, 10 to the negative 2 times some frequency that we choose. Uh, 
But you'll see from this next example that it's kind of hard to get the mass large enough and the KEQ small enough to make that uh, natural frequency low enough to isolate uh, all the hertz, all the frequency hertz from our system completely. So in this example, what we're going to do is try and completely isolate 20 hertz to 150 hertz in this table. And uh, so we're going to choose a really small output to input, input ratio here, something 0 0.001, that's almost zero. And that would be really good isolation. But using that relationship, uh, A output over input equals uh, some frequency over the natural frequency raised to the negative power, you see that your period of the natural frequency would have to be um, five seconds, 0.2 hertz. That's probably not going to happen. Uh, that would be something extremely heavy, sitting on top of something, something with springs that are extremely soft. Uh, it can be done, but uh, there are other factors that are coming to play that make that almost impossible. So you might think, well, okay, instead of 20 hertz being almost zero, maybe we can loosen that tolerance a bit, say, maybe 5%, maybe 6%, because again, if you're not inputting that much amplitude into the system, 5% of a little bit is not a lot at all. Uh, so here's just a reminder of how to combine springs. If you stack them on top of each other, it's 1 over the reciprocal equals the sum of the reciprocals. And in parallel, which is what we're doing, you have four springs under this table, and they're all going to be in parallel, like here. You just add the uh, natural frequency, uh, the k value. So in our table, kq is just 4k because we're using four springs that are the same, so k is the same. k plus k plus k plus k is 4k. And if we remember that the natural frequency is the square root of kq over the mass, we put 4k in for kq, we get the natural frequency is 2 times the square root of k over the mass. And also from Hooke's law, which is the force equals negative kx, that is uh, defines the spring, we can solve for the displacement. And the displacement is important because we need to choose a spring that won't bottom out. If the spring bottoms out, it becomes useless. And uh, so what's happening is uh, you can look online the design parameters and whatnot. Uh, so the spring the displacement you know, can't be more than that. The spring that's a lot. Uh, so we need to include that when we think about kind of what kind of strings we're going to use as well. And uh, let's see. so I'm going to open this Excel thing now and hope here. Just um, I tried to make a table to describe what was going on with this um, with this table, and uh, so this is sort of just my test case. But we don't really have to go over that because I can just go over the real case. Um, so here I computed what the maximum case would be at 20 hertz with out over in amplitudes equaling one. So here I have the mass in, in pounds, and then I convert that to kilograms. This is uh, an arbitrary k value that we can choose. And this is converting it to units per meter, because we're going to do everything in SI units, because it's better. Uh, and by the way, so this k value, when you go online to look at springs, um, these kinds of things will just be there, like this, max displacement, k. Those are just um, general, general values. Uh, easy to get. So this k effective is just four times the k value, which uh, what we computed in the PowerPoint. That's um, the springs in parallel. We can just add them together. Uh, this column here is different frequencies. So I'm going to be plotting this from 10 hertz all the way to 325 hertz, and that'll give us a good, you know, kind of base range. Uh, subwoofers kind of operate between maybe. 15 or 20 up to 200 or 250. Uh, here we're just converting it to radians per second again to stick with uh, stick with what we're doing. And so this is the omega natural, and that's using the uh, the equation that we were talking about in the PowerPoint there, uh, two times the square root of e28, which is our k value um, over uh, c28, which is our mass. And actually, uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. so this ratio then is going to be 
uh, omega over omega naught, which is the frequencies in this column, divided by the natural frequencies. And that output over input column is, again, just using uh, omega over omega naught raised to negative 2 power, because we said that we can make that generalization as long as, um, as, long as we're past that 3.2 value. So when you plot something like that, you'll get a graph like this. And so you've got frequency on the bottom and isolation on the y-axis. And so you can see how if you play uh, like a 40 hertz note, you're going to get an isolation in not that much. Uh, and as you go up in frequency, that, that keeps decreasing. So we can look for springs that are softer with a given mass to get better isolation. This is a real case. This is actually the spring that's in the table right now, is this one. So these are real numbers that we're getting from those springs that are inside the table as we look at it. This is actually what it would be doing. So you see the same thing, we've got the same tables, and what you're going to get is a graph that looks like this. So actually that's good, we can still see the output over input amplitude. Uh, in blue there, that's, I believe, let me just double check, that should be at, at uh, 20, 20 hertz. So at 20 hertz, you're going to get 10.7% of the input amplitude is going to equal the output amplitude. So uh, that's pretty good isolation, pretty good, 10% of the input. And then as you go up to 150 hertz, uh, you're at, you know, maybe point one, or, uh, sorry, what is that, point, uh, yeah, let's see, it's here, you know, you're, you're very low, that's, that's almost zero, and that's going to get better as you go up in frequency. And then these springs, next to that, these kind of <coughs> goldish looking springs, that is this table. And you can see that we're going to get even better, so at 20 hertz in blue there, you're getting 5%, 5.8%, uh, so almost almost 6% uh, output amplitude over the uh, input amplitude. So that is, 5% um, is, is pretty darn good, I think. You're not going to hear a lot of anything at 20 hertz, and uh, obviously that drops a lot as you go up. You can see that on the graph. Uh, even at around 100 hertz, 120 hertz, that's basically zero. So you really, uh, this would be considered, I think, very good isolation. And uh, so that's, you know, probably what I'll be using at home would be, would be those larger springs, but I wanted to put those on the outside because they're a little bigger, easier to see. Uh, these are just other tables I use to calculate kind of theoretical values for things. Uh, I was looking for K for an output uh, over input amplitude to be 0 0.1, so 10% kind of like uh, the springs that are in the table right now, I want of what I should look for online as a K value. And that was about you know 20.5 as a K. And I ended up finding something that was 22. So there you go. And then I was trying to find something that I could maybe use to get you know uh, a much smaller output to input at 20 hertz. But this would require an extremely low K value, and you can see that the displacement um, here is a lot. It's uh, almost two and a half inches. So you would need a very long spring with coils that are very uh, spaced very far apart, and um, you risk buckling at that point, which is where the spring would, um, you know, it would pop out, and, and the whole thing would topple over. So that. With the design parameters that we use, would be hard. You'd have to engineer some kind of system to prevent buckling from happening, and that may decrease your performance in vibration isolation. So, um, but if you want to take a look at, you know, what that would be like on the graph, I mean, that's it's like almost nothing basically. Uh, so, unfortunately, you know, with, with the way we're we're doing things, that's not going to happen. But uh, you know, this is sort of what we ended up with right here. It's not bad. Uh, so that kind of wraps up my talking. I know this was sort of a lot, but um, I hope that you guys understood some of it and learned something. But I, I had a lot of fun designing this, and I had a lot of fun building it. 
Uh, it works pretty well. So, are there any questions about anything that I talked about? Uh, can you hear the difference? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, it's a little quieter, maybe, especially with uh, a lot of times with old vinyl, my subwoofer doesn't turn on because it's, uh, I don't know, it must have been the way that they were recording things back then, not a lot of bass, but when you play newer vinyl, there's a lot more bass and things on, I realize. And uh, so, especially when you're playing a, a newer record or whatever, you'll notice it. Yep. Well, a, a lot of subs sort of roll off pretty heavily at 30 hertz, so your, yeah. your curves might actually be better even for, for a lot of subs. For well, and, and that's, that's exactly true. Uh, this is theoretical performance. So if you had a subwoofer that went down to 20 hertz and all that vibration was going into the table, this is the performance you'd get. And uh, so like I said, worst case, you know, you're going to get better performance than this. Uh, so yeah, good point. Anybody else? Oh, how much did it cost me? Uh, well, I went to Lowe's and got a bunch of materials, but I actually didn't end up using a lot of those materials. So I think I spent like 80 bucks there, but I probably only used like maybe 50 or 40 bucks worth of materials. I got a lot of extra stuff, you know. So yeah, it's really not that expensive. And these tables, if you go online, a really good isolation table might run you 800 to 2,000 bucks. So yeah, <laughs> and they're not using springs either. They're using sand and stuff, uh, not all of them, but I actually sent I, I sent this table on that paper to a guy that sells isolation tables. <laughs> That's how he thought. I don't know, he, he didn't respond back. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so that's it. I hope you guys hope you guys enjoyed it.